Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Marquette University Law School, the Lubar Center. I'm Mike Goucher, and joining me today is Professor Charles Franklin, the director of the Marquette University Law School poll, because we are releasing a new law school poll today. Charles, great to be with you again, and uh, let's go through the basics again. When we were in the field, the sample size, margin of error, those sorts of matters. Absolutely. Um, we were in the field uh, this past week, ending going from Wednesday through Sunday. We interviewed 807 respondents statewide um, of Wisconsin. That has a margin of error of plus or minus 3.8 percentage points. And we asked a, a number of policy-related questions of half the sample so that we could get more policy questions included in the survey. For those half sample items, the margin of error is plus or minus 5.4. People are, are, cur are always curious about the composition of the sample. What can you tell us about this poll? This poll is of uh, 45% Republican, 44% Democratic, when you include people who lean to a party as partisans, and 9% pure independent who don't lean either way. If we take the leaners out, then it's 30% Republican, 29% Democrat, and 40% independent. If we look back over our polling since January of 2019 in all of those polls, the long-term party balance has been 45 Republican, 44 Democratic, and nine independent, as it is in this sample. And partisanship, in excluding leaners, has been 29 Republican, 28 Democratic, and 41 independent. So this sample is a point higher on Republicans and a point higher on Democrats, so slightly fewer on the independents. Well, let's begin with a few headlines from this survey, Charles. And uh, President Biden is now well into his first year in office. This is the first time we've done a statewide poll on uh, President Biden's performance. So let's begin with his job approval. How is President Biden faring in the eyes of Wisconsin voters? He's a bit net negative, but at 49% approval, 46% disapprove, and 4% say they don't have an opinion. Uh, national average of approval right now is about 50.4, so that puts Wisconsin just a shade below that national average, still net positive, but only by about three points. We have uh, been emerging uh, from the pandemic, uh, although there are certainly things happening right now that may put some of that in jeopardy, but the economy has been emerging from that. Uh, and yet, uh, in our poll, the president did not fare all that well on the economy. As with national polling, 46% uh, approve of his handling of the economy, 48% disapprove. So he's just a little bit net negative on that one. And 6% say they don't know. As for the coronavirus here, he, he gets his strongest ratings, 54% approve, 42 disapprove, and 5% say they don't know. Uh, this again is in line with national data that shows his economic approval, a weak spot, his coronavirus approval, a strong spot, and overall approval falling in between. Uh, we asked about Governor Evers, and, and this is something we do in every poll. We ask for job approval for uh, the governor, but this is, I guess, uh, especially important because we are a little more than a year out uh, from a gubernatorial election. So how is the governor faring right now in Wisconsin? Yes, and you know, job approval is one of those things that we monitor for every governor over time. So it's important to look for trends in this as well as absolute standing. Uh, in his overall job approval this month, 50% approve, 43% disapprove, um, a net plus seven on that. We last asked about this in October, just before the election last year, and we got the same numbers, 50% approve, 43 disapprove. Earlier in 2020, his job approval was in the mid to upper 50s, so it has settled from that. However, as you can see, no change between last October and now. How about his handling of the coronavirus, Charles? Again, a strong suit for him as for President Biden, 54% approved, 39 disapproved. In October, it was 52 approved, 45 disapproved. 
So actually his net approval on handling the virus has actually gone up a bit from where it was in October. And again, this was a real strong suit for Evers in the spring and summer and fall of uh, 2020. It slipped down a bit in September and October and is now maybe a little bit higher than it was in October last year but still a strong suit and still solidly net positive for him. A uh, Republican U.S. Senator Ron Johnson, uh, he is uh, still yet to announce whether or not he will run for a third term in office. But again, he will be on the ballot uh, should he decide to run in November of next year. Uh, how is Senator Johnson faring with Wisconsin voters? And as with uh, Governor Evers, uh, Senator Johnson, with that potential election, re-election bid, it's worth looking at these numbers over time to see how they're shifting, if they're shifting at all. In this month's poll, Senator Johnson was viewed favorably by 35% of respondents and unfavorably by 42. 23% said they didn't have an opinion of him. Those numbers are a little more negative than they were last October when 38 were favorable, 36 were unfavorable, and 26 lacked an opinion. So while his favorable number has changed by going down about three points, the unfavorable has shifted up by six points. That's a bit of a shift and leaves him with one of his more negative, net negative readings in his uh, in the time that we've been measuring him since 2013. Uh, his lowest though was a while ago in November of 2015, when he was 27 favorable, 38 unfavorable. Uh, and so that was a much more net negative reading than what we're seeing this time, but there has been some slippage. And, and is that amongst uh, independents and Democrats or Republicans, where are we seeing that? Yeah, as you would expect, it's less among Republicans. Uh, his favorable ratings among Republicans are unchanged between Oct uh, last October and now, 70% favorable both times. But his unfavorables with Republicans inched up by four points from eight to 12 points uh, unfavorable. But independents moved more uh, from a 36 favorable to 31 favorable and from 35 up to 39 unfavorable. And finally, among Democrats, the favorable move ratings hardly budged, but the unfavorables went up by 10 points. So both independents and Democrats moved noticeably in a more negative direction towards Senator Johnson, while his Republican base stayed pretty solid for him, but maybe inched up slightly in the unfavorable category. And how is uh, Senator Johnson's uh, Democratic counterpart, uh, Tammy Baldwin, doing in this poll? Uh, she's 40% uh, favorable, 39 unfavorable, 21 without an opinion. And uh, that's also down a little bit. In October, she was at 44 favorable and 36 unfavorable. So a little tighter on that uh, at a plus one this time versus a plus eight uh, in October. One of the uh, things we looked at in this poll, Charles, was how people feel about the way uh, government is performing and we get a sense of sort of the, I guess, the, uh, the way people feel about how things are working or not working in America today. And, and one number that was pretty stunning, at least to me, and I think maybe to you, was uh, this question that we ask in virtually all of our polling. It's a, it's a right direction, wrong track question. Do you think we're moving in the right direction or are we on the wrong track? What did we see this time around? Yeah, this is a widely used question. Um, and this month, 51% say that Wisconsin's gotten off on the wrong track. Just 38% say we're headed in the right direction. Um, that's quite a turnaround. We last asked this question back in March of 2020. And at that point, 61% said we were headed in the right direction, 30% the wrong direction. I will flag that though, that was an unusually high reading right then. If we look back earlier from January and February of 2020, we were seeing numbers that were still net positive, but about 50% right direction rather than the 60% we or 61% we saw in March. Um, this is a tricky question because 
you can feel like uh, things are going in the right direction because the economy is better, your party's a strong leader, something like that. But you can also feel like things are off in the wrong track because of the conflict people see and the sense on both parties' sides that government isn't working very well right now. Yeah, and, and that was something you asked about. I mean, I think this is an important point. Uh, you can see that people are really uh, uh, struggling with the way our government is or isn't working. So let's talk about how they view that, whether or not uh, uh, things are working as they're intended or whether or not government is broken. We asked that both about Wisconsin and nationally. And I think this is, to me, one of the most important findings of the poll because of what it says about where we feel our systems of government are right now. We asked half of the sample if the government in Wisconsin is working as it was intended or if it's broken. 32% said working as intended, 60% say that Wisconsin's government is broken. The other half sample, we asked exactly the same question, but we asked about the government in Washington. And with that question, just 10%, 10 say it's working as intended, 84% say the government in Washington is broken. That is a very depressing number. Wisconsin's depressing enough, but Washington is far worse for what it says about our confidence in the government, our confidence in the way leadership in the Congress and the presidency uh, are, are handling the business of government. And to say it's broken is a pretty stark statement. And for 84% to say that of the country as a whole, that's very, very unsettling. What is our confidence in election results and the election outcomes? Another aspect of this, and again, we asked this in two half samples. One about the vote in Wisconsin, was it cast accurately and counted accurately? Um, and one for the country as a whole. Um, for the national wording, 60% say they're very or somewhat confident that the election was counted accurately, while 38% say they're not very or not at all confident. Um, we also asked that question prospectively back in October when 69 were confident or very confident and 30 were not confident. So you can see that that confidence did come down in the turmoil over the election. In Wisconsin, the numbers are not very different, slightly more confident. 67% say they're very or somewhat confident. 31% say they're not very or not at all confident about the accuracy of the election count in Wisconsin it's, itself. And, um, and this varies uh, greatly uh, depending on your politics. If you're a Republican, you uh, are much more uh, likely to believe that that was not counted uh, well or accurately. Certainly, this is true. We've seen this embedded in our politics at least since the election and President Trump's uh, uh, dispute of the election results on January 6th in various uh, states doing forensic uh, recounts or examinations of the ballots. Um, on the question about accuracy of the count across the country, uh, just 22% of Republicans are confident in the outcome, 72% not. But a big majority, 69% of independents are confident, 28% not. And among Democrats, nearly universal, 94% confident, 4% not. In Wisconsin, again, those numbers are just a little bit more confident. Still, though, only 29% of Republicans are confident in the outcome, 71 are not. 72% uh, of independents are confident, only 26% of independents are not. And 97% of Democrats are confident and 3% are not. So the partisan divide here is enormous. Um, roughly a fifth to a fourth of Republicans do say they're confident in the election outcome. But that leaves three quarters yeah. of Republicans who are uh, in doubt or at least express real doubt about the accuracy of the count. 
One of the outcomes of this election has been uh, a lot of legislation around the country, including some here in Wisconsin, um, uh, uh, as Republicans would say, designed to address election integrity issues. Um, um, and, and Governor Ito, Governor Evers already vetoed uh, a number of those measures. Um, but um, we asked a couple of more general questions that I think get some sense of how the public feels about the state of our elections. The first one is we asked about voter ID which has now been in effect in Wisconsin for a number of years. How do people feel about it now, for example, compared to uh, back in 2014, Charles? Yeah, in this sample, 73% uh, said they support requiring a photo ID to vote. 22% oppose the photo ID requirement. When we asked about it in October of 2014, when it was still relatively new, 60% supported, 36% opposed. This is in line with national polling that has shown that photo ID has grown in support over time and commands substantial majorities of the kind we're seeing here uh, on requiring an ID to vote. What about support for automatic voter registration for eligible citizens? And, and this is the flip side. If photo ID is intended to uh, prevent fraud or, or to make it a bit more challenging to vote. Um, another alternative is something called automatic voter registration, which would automatically register eligible 18 year olds when they turn 18. Um, and support for that was substantial, 63% favor automatic registration of 18 year olds, 31% opposed. Uh, we've not asked about automatic registration before. Uh, but I can tell you as someone who had to help get an 18 year old registered recently, uh, it's kind of challenging when you don't have a paycheck and you don't have a utility bill uh, as an 18 year old. So automatic registration is something that's being talked about around the country uh, as I think been implemented in a couple of places, but is still not widespread. But as you can see from these numbers, has pretty substantial potential public support. Uh, how about uh, this question, Charles? Are voting rules or do voting rules make it um, too difficult for eligible citizens to vote or are the rules not strict enough? And, and this seems that to capture sort of the, the, <laughs> the split between wanting to make, make it uh, secure in the voting to prevent fraud, but also not discouraging people from voting. But we put it as choose this option or that option, even if, one, if neither of them is exactly what you think. 43% said the rules are making it too difficult to vote, and 43% said the rules are not strict enough. So a pretty even split. I should just mention in earlier polling, we asked whether uh, fraud was a large number of votes or whether people being discouraged from voting was a larger number of, of people. And in those surveys a few years ago, uh, people thought fraud was not insignificant, but they thought discouraging people from voting was affected more people. So this is something we may dip into more later. But as you can see on this question this time, it's an even split for whether we're making it too hard uh, to vote or not secure enough to vote. Let's take a look at how people feel about a number of issues that are out there. The first one we'll talk about is uh, the big infrastructure package. And, and this, the, the numbers here are somewhat in dispute. I mean, we hear uh, reports in the news about a $1.2 trillion infrastructure package, but other people report it as you know, just over 500 millions in new funding. Uh, how did we ask the question and what did we find? Yeah, this question gave me some pause as I tried to write it. Uh, what I discovered is that the total package is a bit over a trillion dollars, but the amount of new spending on infrastructure is about uh, just a bit over 500 billion. Um, so in tracking this down, I went back and read a number of news stories and found that stories sometimes reported it as over a trillion, sometimes reported as 500, 550 billion in new spending. And a few stories even used both numbers in that. 
So after some consideration of the balance of coverage and how it was being talked about, and that the coverage was very consistent when it mentioned new spending as saying 500, 550 billion in new spending. Mm -hmm. That's the number we went with for the new spending part of the package. And in our question, we said uh, 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 this increase, $500 billion increase in new spending for infrastructure. With that caveat of how we worded it, 53% favor the infrastructure package, 37% oppose it. Uh, and this survey was in the field while the debate over the bipartisan bill was going through in the last week or going on in the last week. So there was a fair bit of discussion of it at the time. A lot of talk about uh, rising crime rates in parts of America. We asked this question really for people about their own community, but then also to get their impressions about what's happening nationally. What did we find there? Right. And again, we used a half sample here. So half the sample were asked about crime increasing in their own community. 43% said crime is up over the last year. But 22% said it's lower than a year ago, and 26% say it's about the same. But when we asked about it nationally, 69% said it was up compared to a year ago, just 10% thought it had declined, and just 11% said it had stayed the same. So here you see a clean distinction between what people are experiencing in their own communities, which does include 43% saying it's increase, crime is increasing, but a much higher number in the perception of the country as a whole. There continue to be challenges along the U.S. border with uh, illegal immigration, uh, immigration issues. Uh, how concerned are voters in Wisconsin uh, about illegal immigration? Yeah, trying to get a, a a measure of how concerned people are about this. 70, uh, I'm sorry, 37% said they're very concerned about illegal immigration and another 23% somewhat concerned. 21% not, not very concerned and 18% not at all concerned. So uh, that's a fair bit of concern, but some of the other measures we ask about have higher levels of concern. Uh, despite the fact that illegal immigration has certainly been a, a hot topic for political discussion this year and for a long time. Is inflation uh, one of those that, that has an even higher level of concern? It is. And this is, you know, something that we haven't worried much about until recently. But in this sample, 49 percent say they're very concerned about inflation, 36 percent somewhat concerned 21 not too concerned and just 3% not at all concerned. So this will be something to watch. Um, those of us who are old enough to remember when inflation was a big deal uh, can remember how potent this issue can become. It has not been present in public opinion surveys for quite a while of people being worried about it. But I think these numbers are concerning and something to pay attention to going forward. Charles, uh, we've seen uh, wages rise because of uh, a changing labor market out there since the uh, we we begun to uh, to move out of the I want to say the worst of the pandemic. Hopefully, we'll say the worst of the pandemic. Um, but um, I, I wanted to ask you about that. How, how do people feel about the minimum wage being set at fifteen dollars an hour? Are they supportive of that? Uh, yes, uh, on balance, we specifically said a $15 minimum wage, 51% supported that, 44% uh, opposed it, so a, a net of seven points in favor of it. We asked this in 2019, but without mentioning a specific dollar amount, just did people feel like the minimum wage should be increased then? And with that question wording, support was a little higher, 57% favored 38 opposed. However, since we didn't mention the dollar amount, uh, these two questions aren't exactly comparable to one another. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that uh, happened during the pandemic is a, a policy decision that was made uh, to add $300 a week uh, to unemployment benefits. And, and this is now the subject of a fair amount of debate, whether it's time for that to end or whether it should continue, whether it's uh, um, still needed or whether it's hurting uh, uh, the labor market, essentially. What, what did we find? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, and and here the majority is pretty solid. Uh, 67% say that this benefit is keeping people from returning to work. Just 27% said these were necessary and needed to be continued. Uh, this program is generally phasing out soon, mm -hmm. but since it has been debated and in fact was debated in the legislature and with the governor this summer, we thought it was a good idea to get a reading of it. And as you can see, by a, a two to one margin, people think it's keeping people from going back to work. Uh, we do a fair amount of work here at, at the law school that touches on uh, schools. Uh, and part of that is because of uh, one of our colleagues, Alan Borsick, who uh, has written uh, skillfully about schools and education for a long time now. Um, let's uh, talk about what we asked in this poll, Charles. Let's begin with the, I guess, the general satisfaction or dissatisfaction people have with their public schools. Uh, yes. And, and in the big picture here, one of the questions, the broad question, not the specific question, is whether the difficulties of carrying school on either remotely or in person over the last year with the coronavirus, has that really affected people's views of the schools aside from just their overall satisfaction levels? In this poll, 69 percent say they're either very satisfied or satisfied with the job public schools are doing in their community, 22% say they're dissatisfied or very satisfied, dissatisfied, <clears throat> excuse me. When we last asked about this was in January last year, January of 2020, uh, before the coronavirus hit. At that point, 59% were satisfied or very satisfied and 33% dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. So what we're seeing is actually about a 10 point rise in satisfaction with local public schools, despite all of the difficulties that the last year of COVID has uh, imposed on the school systems. And uh, as much as we like our public schools, we, we like our, our public school teachers even better, I guess. Well, <laughs> apparently we do. We asked a favorability question uh, about public school teachers, 72% said they have a favorable view, 14% unfavorable, and 13% didn't have an opinion. We haven't asked this in a long time. The last time was in March of 2013. And then it was 76 favorable, 14 unfavorable, and nine without an opinion. So a shade higher on favorable, but still very much in the same ballpark. Uh, back in 2013 as it is today. Something else we've asked about uh, from time to time is whether it's more important to hold down property taxes or more important to increase spending on public schools. A little bit of movement in this poll, Charles, on that question. And we've been tracking this for quite a while. In August, 43% say it's more important to hold down property taxes. 52% say it's more important to increase spending on public schools. We asked this one last February, February of 2020, and it was 38% then who wanted to hold down property taxes and 56% favored increasing spending on public schools. If we go way back in 2012 and 2013, um, we saw this question about evenly balanced with slightly more people in favor of holding down property taxes rather than increasing spending. Then in 2015, this reversed with uh, support for increased spending for schools rising sharply and ultimately rising into the 60% range. That fell off a little bit in 2018 to the high 50s. And as you can see, drifted down to the mid 50s by last year and now in the low 50s uh, today, 52%. Uh, the pro those most concerned about property taxes have inched up a bit from the mid 30s to the low 40s now. So there has been some change in this with it both rising in important ways after 2015, but then beginning to come back down a bit, though that decline began around 2018. It's not something that came specifically during the COVID crisis. What kind of support, Charles, is there amongst the public for increased spending on special education? Special education does get really strong support and has in the past. 72% say they would favor a major increase 
in spending for special ed. 19% oppose it. We asked about this in April of 2019 when it was 74% in support of increasing. Uh, that has barely moved. And so uh, we're looking at a pretty stable uh, set of views on special ed. There are a fair number of uh, uh, Republicans who would like to see um, enrollment uh, expanded for students in voucher schools, um, allow more students to attend voucher schools. Uh, the governor has not been supportive of that. We asked about voucher schools in this poll. And, and what we find is basically an even split. 46% favor expanding the number of students with vouchers, 44% oppose it. We've not asked this question in the past. We've asked about voucher schools in the past, but with substantially different question wording. So we really can't compare that. Uh, I think one question was, again, whether uh, the difficulties of the coronavirus might have changed people's views. We can't say whether they changed or not, but it does seem like it's basically an even split on increasing the voucher system. Around the country, we've seen uh, school board meetings with some pretty uh, heated debate about critical race theory and whether this should be taught in public schools. One of the arguments is that it's not being taught in public schools. It's more of a, a college or graduate level uh, discussion, but it is being talked about a lot. And so we decided to ask a question about it. And, and this is one of those prototypical uh, culture war issues that get seized on and used. And, and there is certainly a question about how widespread critical race theory is in, in K-12 education, at least. But what our findings show, I think, that's more important out of this is that uh, fully 45% uh, of respondents said that they did not know enough about this issue to have an opinion about it. And I think this is a good way of highlighting the fact that when we get um, high percentage, uh, uh, yet a lot of attention in the media to a, a hot button issue like this, it doesn't always uh, get perceived by the broader public as the critical issue that the, uh, that the uh, media may portray it to be. That said, of those with opinions, 26% favor teaching critical race theory in schools, and 30% oppose teaching it. So a pretty straightforward, even, dare I say, partisan balance there, but with an awful lot of people who are not aware of what this issue is in the first place. It's been a challenging school year for um, teachers, administrators, and parents. Uh, at the end of the day, Charles, uh, do people feel like we open the schools too quickly? Did we uh, take too long to open them or did we do it at, at the right pace? Yeah, and, and this was our last look at the travails of uh, the schools with uh, COVID this year. What we found is 26% say the schools open too slowly in their community. 13% said they'd open too quickly. And a majority, 54%, said that schools had reopened at about the right pace. So this, uh, I guess, leads us into a number of coronavirus and vaccine-related questions. And, I, I, and we can begin with sort of a similar question to the last one we just talked about. And that's whether or not uh, the closing of businesses and schools last year was the right thing to do, the prudent thing to do, or was it an overreaction? How do people feel about that now with a little hindsight? Uh, and precisely that hindsight is what we were interested in. 62% say it was an appropriate response to close businesses and schools. 35% say it's an overreaction. Initial support for the closures back in March was really enormous. 86% then supported the shutdown. 10% said it was an overreaction. That dwindled a bit over the summer, but when we last asked in October, 68% still said the shutdown was appropriate. 26% said it was an overreaction. Now, uh, in this summer, we still see that 62% appropriate, but now 35% an overreaction. So the balance here is still quite strong in favor of those shutdown measures, but it has narrowed a bit over time. 
So this is a survey of registered voters, uh, adults, 18 plus. Um, so uh, how many of them have received at least one shot of the vaccine? In our survey, 68% say they've received at least one dose of the vaccine. 26% say they've not been vaccinated. But interestingly, another 7% say they don't know or they decline to answer the question. And most of those decline to answer rather than saying don't know. Um, so you see in that maybe a little a little bit of hesitancy to talk about having been vaccinated. Um, we do have an outside benchmark here, yeah. which is nice for a poll. As of August the 8th, uh, the New York Times reports Centers for Disease Control data saying that among adults 18 and over in Wisconsin, 68% have received at least one dose, just matching our 68% in this survey. So that's reassuring in terms of the survey matching an external data source and shows that we're getting really right on what the CDC's number for vaccinations is. So well, these numbers suggest there are about 26% who say, uh, no, they haven't gotten vaccinated, and then a few more who, who didn't want to uh, answer the question for, for their own reasons. Um, of those who have not received the vaccination, um, what do they say, Charles? Are they going to get it someday, or are they just saying, nope, never? There's a lot of resistance here. 49% of the unvaccinated say they will definitely not get the vaccine. Uh, another 27% say they probably won't get it. Eight say they definitely will, and 14 say they probably will. So basically we're, lo basically we're looking at about a quarter of the unvaccinated who seem to be planning to get vaccinated, but haven't yet. But around three quarters who are not vaccinated and don't seem very anxious to do that. And there's a strong relationship here, Charles, between um, partisanship and, and reluctance here. Uh, what did we see in terms of that? Yes. Yeah, so first of all, just on whether you've been vaccinated or not, 45% of Republicans say they've been vaccinated, 43% say they've not, and 11% declined to answer. Among independents, it's 71 vaccinated, 23 not. And among Democrats, 87% have been vaccinated, 11% not. Um, of those who are not yet vaccinated, among Republicans, 55% say they'll definitely not get it, and 28% say they probably won't get it. Just 14% say they definitely or probably will. With independence, it's 45% definitely won't get it and 22 probably not get it. But even among Democrats who've not been vaccinated, 32% say they'll definitely not get it and 32% say they probably won't get it. And so there is still uh, in this unvaccinated population some differences by party, but there's considerable reluctance among Democrats and independents, as well as Republicans. Yeah, it would seem to suggest there is a certain ceiling, at least based on this poll, for how many people will ultimately get vaccinated, that it's only going to go so high. Unless we see people changing their minds, yeah. and there have been increases in the vaccination rates in some of the states that have been hard hit by this surge in the Delta virus in the last month or so, um, but we'll have to see if you take people at their words, there's a lot of reluctance out there. Uh, let's uh, wrap things up with maybe uh, three favorability questions and then a final question for you. And, and the first question, Charles, about favorability is we've been asking about the Black Lives Matter movement uh, since back in uh, really, I think, probably June of uh, 2020, uh, right after the, uh, uh, the Floyd uh, uh, death in, in Minneapolis. Um, so how do people feel today about Black Lives Matter? 46% are favorable towards the Black Lives Matter movement, 40% uh, unfavorable, 13% without an opinion. We tracked this throughout last summer and fall. In October, 47 rated the BLM movement favorably and 39 rated it unfavorably. So very little change over these last months since October. 
Same is true for our attitudes toward police officers, correct? And here, even less change, if you will, uh, 80% favorable towards the police, 13 unfavorable. Um, in October, it was 80% favorable and 12% unfavorable. We also asked about the former president, Donald Trump. And here, 37% view him favorably today, 55% unfavorable with seven not giving an opinion. In October, his favorability was higher at 44% and 54 unfavorable. So there's been little movement in the unfavorable, but a bit of a seven point decline in the favorable rating for the former president. So, so my final question is this, Charles, uh, I'm sure there will be uh, political strategists and uh, close observers of the, uh, um, the political landscape who will say, well, why were there no questions about uh, the candidates in the gubernatorial race or the candidates in the U.S. Senate race? I think there are close to 10 Democratic candidates now in that race. So why didn't we decide to poll on those races, naming names and getting a first look at this field? Yeah, well, because it is such a large field and so early in the campaign um, that we don't really have much of a campaign going on that's visible to the public at this point. You know, over the last few years, there's been a lot of discussion about whether polling does too much horse race coverage. Well, I'm all in favor of horse race coverage. It's something that we do and that I think is important. But I also think that it's important not to do uh, early polling when many of these candidates haven't yet even had the chance to establish themselves with the, with the public. If you go back to the 2018 governor's race, we also had a very large Democratic primary that year. And we saw very few of the candidates becoming at all visible even into the summer, a month or two before the primary election. So we will certainly poll about the candidates on the uh, Democratic side of the primaries and the Republicans on the Republican side for governor. And if, if Senator Johnson doesn't run again, uh, there may be a primary there. So there'll be plenty of time for us to look at those questions of the horse race. But I think it's simply too early to get meaningful readings we'd essentially just be getting name recognition and we wouldn't have seen these candidates after they've started campaigning in a serious way sometime next year. The, the great mystery will all unfold in the months to come, right, Charles? Undoubtedly it will. <laughs> all right, uh, I wanna thank you again for your, uh, your time and your uh, excellent work on this. It's always good to be with you, Charles Franklin, the professor and director of the Marquette University Law School Poll. And thanks to all of you who are tuning in today for these poll results. We'll see you next time.